Right. Um, welcome to Simon, Simon Whitehouse. This is his third trip to SAGE. Delighted to welcome you back, Simon. Uh, we've already had two very interesting talks from Simon, one about Covent Garden and the previous one on Charles Dickens. And here we go this afternoon on Agatha Christie. Um, Simon is going to tell us about social changes of the life in Britain throughout the 20th century and investigate the real life mystery of Agatha Christie's disappearance, her lesser known role as a West End playwright and her links to the British Museum. So Simon, welcome and over to you. Fantastic Stuart. Well, thank you ladies and gentlemen for having me back a third time, third time lucky. This might be a good one, mightn't it? Um, and, and to Daphne for uh, uh, organizing as well. Uh, delighted to be back. And actually, as it happens, I'm well, I'm joining you virtually, of course, um, from Covent Garden. And just behind me, you might be able to make out the monument to Dame Agatha Christie that was unveiled in 2012 to commemorate the 60th anniversary, the Diamond Jubilee of the Mousetrap opening at the St Martin's Theatre just up the road. In fact, when we did Covent Garden, I might have touched on this. I usually do mention the monument when I when I discuss Covent Garden. I'm going to lean over so you can see it. You can see um, it's got Agatha Christie's very famous signature on it. And I'll come back to tell you a little bit about it during the presentation. But it's often something people walk past in Covent Garden. And I tell you why, because it's in the middle of a little traffic island just across from the Arts Theatre and normally a busy rushing across the road to get to the theatre or doing something else. So people often whiz by it. So uh, next time you're in Covent Garden, um, take a good look at it because it's it's wonderful. OK, great. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we're here to talk about the life and crimes of Dame Agatha Christie. And before I ask you in a moment to switch off your uh, video screens just to maximise the bandwidth, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, out of interest, you know, Agatha Christie fans here today? Thumbs up if you're an Ag uh, Agatha Christie fan. Yes, good, good. Um, anyone not 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 sort of not necessarily a big fan? Anyone? Because I find yeah. No, no. I, the other day I spoke to a colleague of mine, um, a Blue Badge Guide. Can you believe another Blue Badge Guide? She said she'd never read an Agatha Christie in her life, and she got. I was quite surprised by that. I thought I think some. I mean, all of us have read an Agatha Christie at some point, and then I thought, oh well, you know, maybe, um, maybe. You know, there are people that haven't. So, um, and I think during lockdown, gosh, you know, Agatha Christie provides absolute perfect, you know, escapism. And I think the fact that, you know, we get to the end of an Agatha Christie novel and, you know, all the um, the, the clues come together and, uh, you know, the, the puzzle is neatly solved. Um, sorry about that, folks. I'm just going to switch something off. Is... Um, it's quite satisfying, I think, at the moment, isn't it? We, we, we all kind of like the neat solution that comes at the end. And actually, the reason I started to uh, put together this talk was for two reasons, really. Last year was the 130th anniversary of Agatha Christie's birth. So she was born on September the 12th, 1890. So last year was sort of a significant milestone. But also, perhaps equally significantly, is that... Uh, if I, actually, I'll just switch my background so you can see this now. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it. Um, uh, last year was the hundredth anniversary, the centenary of the publication of her first novel, *The Mysterious Affair at Styles*, which I'm holding up for you to see. Sadly, this is not a first edition because um, I think if it, if it was a first edition. Um, I might be able to retire, I don't know. But anyway, um, but that's a, a fac facsimile copy. But so last year was was a big year for Agatha Christie uh, for those two reasons. And we'll discuss a little bit about uh, this. And so this is always a good starting point. You know, if you haven't picked up Agatha Christie for a while, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. All right, so without further ado, uh, I might ask you just to switch off your video screens if you wouldn't mind just for uh, maximize bandwidth. Use the chat if you think of any questions, of course, and then we'll have a chance at the end um, when I bring you all together in the library at the end of this talk and reveal the identity of the murderer, <gasps> which I've always wanted to say. I've always wanted to do that. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Right, anyway, let's let's get going. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I might get Stuart or Ronnie just to give me the thumbs up. So if you keep your video on for a moment, just 
to make sure the tech is all okay. Fantastic, great. And by the way, just occasionally, because of my internet, sometimes my voice goes a bit weird. It goes a bit sort of slow, but you might have found that before, but don't worry, it does eventually catch up. Right, this is um, a photograph of the waxwork of Dame Agatha Christie, which used to be displayed in Madame Tussauds Waxworks on Baker Street. Now, why am I showing you that? Because really, that's how I first kind of got hooked on Agatha Christie myself. When I was a child, I'm not a native Londoner, I came down on a trip to London, went to Madame Tussauds, and in the old days when Madame Tussauds was really fabulous, you know, there was a wonderful conservatory, I don't know if anyone remembers, that this wonderful conservatory, and I remember as a child being taken around, seeing all these famous people, and I remember sort of seeing this little old lady uh, uh, sitting on a chair, this lady, and I thought, God, I thought she was real, of course, I thought she was a little old lady that, you know, sort of I had to sit down for five minutes, have a rest. And I was fascinated um, and I wanted to find out more about her. And so I did. And that's kind of what got me into Agatha Christie. And as a sort of young, I suppose, teenager, maybe like 10 or 11, not even a teenager, um, you know, I started to read her books and they were, you know, they're quite easy to read. So for a 10 or 11 year old, um, they're kind of a perfect start. Um, so that's what really got me into Agatha Christie. And I'm going to lead a campaign to have Agatha Christie's waxwork re instated at Madame Tussauds. Now, of course, Madame Tussauds is full of people we've never really heard of or people that think they're celebrities or what have you. Anyway, there we are. That's just um, my little introduction. But here we are. Let's meet the lady herself, Dame Agatha Christie, born 1890. 100 years ago last year, as I said, she published her first detective novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. And over the next 50 years, she would produce a further 65 novels. Extraordinary output. And she would also create 14 short story collections. She also wrote six non-crime novels under a different name under the name Mary Westmacott, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. She created two of the most famous characters, I think in English literature, Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple. And she earned quite deservedly the title, the Queen of Crime, and here she is uh, photographed with her novels on either side of her. Now by 1959, her novels had sold 400 million copies. By 1962, the Bible had been translated into 171 languages. William Shakespeare had been translated into 90 languages. Agatha Christie had been translated into 103 languages. So she'd actually been translated more than Shakespeare by the 1960s. And to date, her books have sold over 4 billion copies. And therefore, she is the world's best-selling novelist. Um, as we all know, I'm sure, almost every novel has been filmed by now for television or cinema, 30 full-length feature films, and not just, of course, a novelist, but a hugely successful playwright. Now, we've mentioned The Mousetrap. We all know The Mousetrap. Perhaps most of us have seen The Mousetrap at some point, but actually she wrote 19 plays. So not only was she the most successful novelist of all time, she is the most successful female playwright of all time. Um, and as a result, you know, she's also become a cultural phenomenon. And I think for people, you know, that whose English is not their first language or people from overseas, you know, Agatha Christie is a great introduction to, you know, the English language and English literature because it's, you know, quite easy to read. But also, I think, you know, the settings of the stories, the sort of, you know, the, the country house and the English village, um, you know, give people a sense of, of sort of Englishness or what they perhaps perceive Englishness to be. Um, so she remains, you know, this, this great global phenomenon. Um, and the producer of her plays in the West End was a man called Peter Saunders. And he described Agatha Christie as being as, as English as Buckingham Palace or the Tower of London. But in actual fact, here's a photograph of Agatha Christie as a child on the left-hand side with her father just to the right. And actually, she was American technically, because her dad was a very wealthy stockbroker from New York. His name was Frederick Miller. And her mother, Clara, who's on the far right of the image now, she was, although born in Belfast, had also American heritage. So it's quite interesting that she actually has American parents on both sides. Um, they'd lived in the US 
but eventually moved down to the south coast of England, which we'll talk about in a minute. But she's born Agatha Christie, 1890. Within that decade, and the, the, the 1890s was known as the, the naughty 90s, you know, uh, and the mauve decade, which is why I've put the mauve background there. And what's interesting is that in the decade that she's born, um, in 1895, uh, two novels were published. The one on the left is The Sign of Four, which was Arthur Conan Doyle's second Sherlock Holmes story. And that was published at the same time that The Picture of Dorian Gray was published by Oscar Wilde on the right-hand side, which is also really, a, you know, lots of horrible murders happen in, in that story. And actually, both Oscar Wilde and Arthur Conan Doyle met at the Langham Hotel. Um, Marylebone, and that's how the stories were born. And in the middle, um, the first sort of publication of fingerprinting was, was produced in 1895 as well by a man called Francis Galton. So all these kind of crime, um, crime aspects, I suppose, are all happening in the 90s. And Agatha would become a huge fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, this is where Agatha grew up. She grew up in Torquay, actually in the nicest part of Torquay, an area called Tor Bay, um, in this beautiful, um, you know, villa uh, on the left hand side. And this was, you know, a very nice upper middle class part of Torquay, what we call the English Riviera today. Um, and although she travels all over the world during her lifetime, Torquay in Devon will be the place that she always comes back to. And in fact, she sets quite a number of her novels in and around the area and in fact she lived in the house until 1938 uh survives um and the blue plaque that you can see just there in front of that little bit of hedge in tor bay is the only reminder of agatha christie's family home but it was a it was called ashfield now uh, her mother was very interesting she was a, a committed christian scientist and she had this belief that girls shouldn't read until they were eight years old but luckily agatha um, was naturally curious and in fact she taught herself to read and she was literate uh, by the age of four years old and she read all the stuff you know treasure island and robinson crusoe and all the you know children's classics but actually her mother introduced her to charles dickens now we we last time I met you we, we we had a chat about Charles Dickens, um, and she 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 had a lifelong love for Dickens and indeed Shakespeare as well later, um, but I thought I'd show you this. This is Bleak House by Charles Dickens, and you may know that Bleak House is one of the very first examples in English literature of a detective story, and uh, one of the first detectives in literature is Inspector Bucket, who solves the murder of. Mr. Tulkinghorn in Bleak House. And in a very extraordinary twist of fate, years later, Agatha Christie was approached to write a screenplay um, for a film version of Bleak House. Um, it never happened in the end, but, um, but, but it nearly happened. So I thought that was, a, that was a, quite a nice link. Now, although she's growing up in Torquay, she does make regular visits to London. And this is Ealing in West London, photographs of it in the very early uh, 1900s. And she went to visit because her auntie granny stayed there, who was her mother's, her mother's aunt, I think that's right, yes. Um, and she said, although the Ashfield was home, she said Ealing represented excitement. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Ealing recently, I don't know how exciting it is. But, um, but at that time, it was terribly exciting. And of course, um, you know, Ealing had been a little rural village, like so many, you know, parts of London. It was known as the Queen of the Suburbs. Um, and of course, you could commute quite easily. And um, on the day that the, the tram service um, opened, the electric tram from Ealing going into the West End, 11-year-old Agatha Christie wrote a poem to mark the occasion. And I mention that because um, her poem was published in the local newspaper. And that was the very first time that Agatha Christie had her work published. And it goes like this. When first the electric trams did run in all their scarlet glory, it was well but ere the day was done, it was another story. But I thought that was quite a nice little, uh, and there you can see the electric trams uh, heading into the West End. Right, moving on. In 1914, she was 24 years old um, and her life and her world completely changed because she met and married this very dashing, handsome officer from the Flying Corps. His name was Archibald Christie or Archie as he became known. And they get married as the First World War 
begins and immediately he goes off uh, to war. Marriage is disrupted. Uh, a child was born, her, their own, her only child, Rosalind, a girl uh, in the uh, middle of the First World War. And during the First World War, it detachment, and you can see a photograph of her just there on the left-hand side in her nurse's uniform. 90,000 volunteers worked for the VAD at home and abroad. Um, Two-thirds of them were women, and of course they provided vital auxiliary support to the naval and the military forces. And very importantly, she, I think she saw the effects of the violence from the First World War, you know, the blood and the dirt and all the terrible injuries, of course. Um, and you can see her nursing record card is, uh, is just there. So she worked at the local hospital in Torquay at the time. Um, she had caught the flu at some point during her nursing work um, and was in bed for several weeks and decided after that that she was going to work, uh, retrain and work in the dispensary at the local hospital. And in order to do that, uh, she had to go and sit examinations to become um, what we now call, you know, a pharmacist. So this is the Apothecaries Hall, which you might know is the headquarters of the Worshipful Company of Apothecaries in the City of London. It's the oldest surviving livery hall in the city. And she sat in 1917 uh, for her ex examination for assistance to allow her to legally disagree papers. Um, and then she had to go back, I think, and take the third one again. Um, so, as, so she sits the exams here and goes back to Torquay and now works in the dispensary. And in 1916, she goes off to a hotel nearby in Dartmoor because she's a bit bored working in the dispensary because there were quite a long sort of hours in between shifts and her sister uh, she has two siblings and her, and her older sister dares her to write a novel to alleviate her boredom and this novel turns out to be the mysterious affair at styles now you'll notice uh, so there's the same as the cover that i showed you notice it was published there in 1920 it was written in 1916. In fact, she was rejected by three, they regretted that, didn't they, um, a few years later. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it is her first novel. Most writers, you know, kind of, you know, find their way, they experiment in the first few novels and then they, they find their formula. But Agatha Christie had all the elements of the things we associate with her in this first novel. It's set in a big country house called Styles in Essex, um, the victim is bumped off by lethal poison. A, a brilliant detective is brought in in the form of Hercule Poirot. Um, he's got a rather hopeless sidekick. There's a police inspector getting things wrong. Um, you've got servants. You've got false beards. Um, um, a whole range of red herrings. And at the end, there's this great summing up. And originally, Agatha Christie was going to have the summing up in a courtroom. But then she had the idea of... Poirot getting all the suspects in the drawing room of the country house together and, you know, eliminating them one by one. And of course, you know, that formula, of course, has been copied by, you know, so many um, people and never, never quite as well, I think. Um, and although, you know, we kind of associate, I think, Agatha Christie with the big grand country house, actually, a lot of her novels were written in small towns and, and villages. Um, some of them were in exotic locations, but the majority of them uh, were not in the great grand locations that we always think. Um, now, it's no surprise that um, in this first novel, because of her training, Agatha Christie um, poisons her first victim using strychnine, which is an odorless alkaloid with a very bitter taste. And strychnine will go on to feature in four further novels and five short stories, and indeed will become Agatha's favourite method of murder. Here's a few examples just to uh, show you. So we've got strychnine there just on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, I think Agatha Christie can uh, go down as being um, the biggest serial killer of all time, really, because she killed over 300 characters during the course of her novels. And she uses poison 51 times in 30 different compounds. Now, in real life, of course, um, poisoning these days, of course, is hardly ever used. Um, but if you think about it, um, at the time that she's writing, you know, um, 
toxic plants like um, you know foxglove, which of course you've got here, you get digitalis from that, uh, yellow jasmine, um, hemlock, grew you know pretty easily and legally in, in people's gardens. So, so these were very domestic poisons. And things like arsenic and strychnine were still being used um, in medicine, although they were being replaced by barbiturates. Um, and of course, she also uses fantastically exotic poisons like this one on the upper left, the poison of the, the venom of the African boom snake, um, which appears in Death in the Clouds. Um, and um, I think what's kind of interesting about it is that because, she, of course, she'd seen all this horror of the First World War, the injuries, I think she was aware that her readers probably didn't want blood and shotguns and stabbings. Uh, they wanted something a little bit more sedate. And actually, a lot of the murders in the stories uh, happen off stage. You, you, you don't, you know, she doesn't describe the murder. The murder's already happened. And I think that was kind of, you know, she, she really thought about that. Um, in fact, when they, when she published the Mysterious Affair at Styles, she got a fantastic compliment from the pharmaceutical journal. And uh, the review said, this novel has the rare merit of being correctly written. Um, and if you're interested in this subject, and it is quite fascinating, this lady called um, Catherine Harkup, who's a, a, a biochemist, she, she's written this wonderful book all about the poisons of Agatha Christie. Uh, it goes into great detail about how the poisons work and how they kill the people and so on. Fascinating stuff. Right. In the same novel, we meet our great detective. Every detective novel needs a great detective. Now, remember, she's a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. She doesn't want to copy Sherlock Holmes. So she creates this extraordinary character, a little rather effete foreigner with the most masculine name in English literature, Hercules, of course. Uh, and he becomes Hercule Poirot. Now, she said Agatha Christie that she couldn't remember where she got the name from. But in fact, in 1913, a lady called Marie Belloc Lowndes had created a retired French detective called Hercule Popo. And I have to say, I do think there's almost too much of a coincidence between the two. Um, and this is how Poirot first appears to us in an illustration in the middle uh, in a story called Poirot Investigates. And I just thought I'd read to you the description that we get uh, of Poirot from his sidekick, Captain Hastings. Hastings tells us in The Mysterious Affair at Styles. he says, he was hardly more than five feet four inches, but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little on one side. His moustache was stiff and military. Even if everything on his face was covered, the tips of the moustache and the pink tip nose would be visible. The neatness of the attire was incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Yet this quaint, dandified little man, who, I was sorry to say, now limped badly, had been in his time one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. In fact, Poirot himself introduces himself as probably the greatest detective in the world. Now, why did she create a Belgian detective? Well... When she was working in Torquay, there were Belgian refugees that had come over during the First World War, and um, they, they were held in great um, regard, the Belgians, as being very brave people. And one of the characters in, in the novel, um, Styles, the maid, says, I don't hold with foreigners as a rule, but from what the newspapers say, I makes out as though these brave Belgians isn't the ordinary run of foreigners. And although Agatha Christie gets accused of being rather anti-foreign and sometimes being quite stereotyped in her sort of outlook, actually she's very clever because Poirot exaggerates his accent sometimes and he exaggerates how foreign he is. And people assume that he's a stupid foreigner. But of course, in doing that, uh, they tend to confide in him and tell him things that they probably wouldn't tell anybody else. And that's how he manages to, you know, pick up clues. So Agatha Christie, I think, was doing something rather clever. Um, and also, her detective was quite unusual compared to the contemporary detectives of the age, which, which we'll talk about. For those of you that know the television series um, that, of course, was made so wonderfully with David Suchet as uh, Poirot in the 1980s and 1990s, this building is in Charterhouse Square, uh, just on the northern edge of the City of London. It's called um, Florin Court, and it's a wonderful Art Deco building from the late 1920s. And this is where they have Poirot living in, in the TV series. Um, and it's known as Whitehaven Mansions. That's, that, that's the name of the 
at the mansion flat. So it's all wonderful 1920s London. Um, and of course, we are most familiar, I think, if we haven't read the stories for a while, we've probably seen, you know, all the time on the TV, all the television and film versions, um, including, of course, Peter Ustinov, who played Poirot um, in Death on the Nile, um, Albert Finney, who played him wonderfully in Murder on the Orient Express um, in the 1970s, and Kenneth Branagh has played him just more recently in a new version of Murder on the Orient Express, just came out two years ago, and is going, and he's going to reappear in Death on the Nile um, later this year, I think, depending on, I suppose, uh, COVID. But there's our wonderful David Suchet, as probably, I think, for most people, now the most uh, memorable and the most, perhaps the best, uh, Poirot that's been depicted. Anyway, um, now what makes Agatha Christie interesting is that she's written this first novel, um, but her second novel was completely different. And we don't see Poirot in the second novel. We get a novel called The Secret Adversary, and we meet two completely different detectives and their names are Pommy and Tuppence Beresford. And they are two young people who um, are out of work after the First World War. They have been friends and they haven't seen each other because of the war. And they bump into each other outside Green Park Underground Station on Piccadilly. And there's an illustration of them. Um, and they are um, they're sort of bright young things from the 1920s, you know, and they go on to get married and they appear in four novels together uh, right the way through Agatha Christie's career. So uh, they go right up until the 1970s and they age accordingly as they go. So we, it's quite interesting if you if you know those characters, because we, we do see you know, the social changes all the way through um, their four novels. Um, and The Secret Adversary was actually, it wasn't a, a detective story as such. I mean, it, well, it was, but it was more um, a, a sort of thriller espionage. And actually through the 1920s, you get a whole series of novels, including The Big Four, which is actually much more like a James Bond novel about uh, these people trying to take over the world and the headquarters of this organization is under a Swiss mountain. I mean, it really is James Bond. Um, and uh, she wrote quite a few of those in the 19 sort of 20s and early 30s. And I think, you know, you don't you don't tend to know that if you just know the films or the TV series, you know, we always think it's in, a, you know, a train stuck in the snow or a closed community of people or whatever. But she did write these quite interesting stories. Um, now, of course, the 1920s and the 30s was the golden age of detective fiction. And Agatha Christie had a number of absolutely wonderful contemporaries. Again, some of you uh, may well be familiar with um, them. You've got um, um, uh, uh, on the left hand side, you've got Josephine Tay, who wrote uh, many wonderful novels, including a terrific um, story about, uh, you know, Richard III, um, which is uh, uh, brilliant. Uh, the name, I've just forgotten, it'll come to me. Um, uh, uh, and then you've got Marjorie Allingham just at the top here, um, and Dorothy L. Sayers just here on the, um, uh, sorry, the plaque to Dorothy L. Sayers just on the bottom. I haven't got a photograph of her. But what's interesting about all of these writers is that, um, is that they tend to write character detectives that are quite upper class, um, you know, Marjorie Allingham wrote Albert Campion, who was this sort of mysterious aristocrat. Dorothy L. Sayers created Lord Peter Whimsey, who's another aristocrat. And uh, Nio Marsh is the lady on the right. And she wrote Roderick Allain, Inspector Allain. Um, and again, they were all quite upper class. Whereas Agatha Christie's detectives, you know, he's a foreign Belgian, you know, police officer. And Miss Marple, who we'll meet in a minute, you know, she, she's a genteel spinster from an English village. So I think, you know, she gets accused of being a bit of a snob, Agatha Christie. But but she was writing for a very middle class audience. And most of the characters in the stories are very much middle class. If you think about it, you know, um, OK, we've got the retired colonels and the vicar's wives and all those people. But we've also got shop girls and show girls and doctors and dentists and solicitors and uh, um, lots of servants appear, you know, in, in the stories. Um, and almost, it's very interesting, though, that all the killers in Agatha Christie are mostly middle and upper class characters um the, the working class characters are often treated with with actually great respect right so that's a bit about her contemporaries in 1926 agatha has what i call her annus mirabilis and she writes the murder of roger Ackroyd, and this has been described arguably as the greatest detective story ever told the victim is roger Ackroyd. he's a rich um 
industrialist. And he's be he was based on William uh, Norris, the, uh, William Morris, the man who became Lord Nuffield and started the Morris uh, garages uh, at uh, Cowley. Um, and uh, Agatha Christie owned very early on, actually, a, a Morris um, a Morris car. Um, now, I can't, of course, ever tell you the identity, of course, of the killer in any of these stories, because you might not have read them yet. But um, I can tell you that when the killer's identity was revealed in this novel, it caused an absolute sensation. Um, and Agatha Christie was accused of cheating, um, and she was almost drummed out of the detection club, which was formed in the 1920s for professional detective writers. And the twist in the story was suggested by Lord Mount Batten. Apparently, he came up with the idea of, of, the, of the twist in the story. And in 2013, um, Agatha Christie was voted the best crime writer of all time. Um, and the, this novel was considered the best crime novel of all time by 600 crime writers of the Crime Writers Association. So you can't really get any higher uh, accolade than that. There were 10 um, commandments or 10 rules that were put together in the 1920s, the 10 golden rules of detective fiction. And I just have to share them with you. They were put together by, by a man called Ronald Knox, who I think was the first president of the detection club. And just look at them. Um, uh, and we, won't, we won't read them all, but, you know, the criminal must be mentioned in the early part of the story, but must not be anyone whose thoughts the reader has been allowed to know. Um, number five is fascinating. No Chinaman must figure in the story. Quite why a Chinaman wasn't allowed to figure, I don't know. Um, the detective himself must not commit the crime. Um, and the last one, twin brothers and doubles in general must not appear unless we've been duly prepared for them <laughs> in advance. Now, I'm not going to tell you which rule Agatha Christie broke because uh, that would give it away. But she did, she was accused of breaking uh, what, at least one of those 10 rules um, in the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Okay, now in the same year, as it being, you know, an Annas Merub, it was also an Annas list for Agatha Christie, because her personal life started to fall apart. Now, she is house in Berkshire, which they named Styles after the first novel. In April of 1926, her mum had died. She was very close to her mother. And in December 1926, her husband announced that he was leaving her for another woman, his golfing companion, a lady called Mrs. Nancy Neal. And 36-year-old Agatha Christie leaves the family home. She jumps into her Morris car and leaves a letter saying that she's off to Yorkshire. And 10 days uh, sorry, a, a couple of days later, uh, so the next morning, in fact, Agatha's car was discovered abandoned near the top of a chalk quarry several miles from the home, uh, just over the border into Surrey. The driver's license was expired, uh, some clothes were in the car, and a nationwide search was on for Agatha Christie. And you can see the newspapers here, the Daily Mirror, the mystery of the woman's disappearance, missing. Um, and a nationwide search began uh, to try and find Agatha Christie. Uh, 500 police were drafted in, hundreds of volunteers. Um, the Daily Mail offered a £100 reward, which would be, you know, a few, few thousand a day. And in an extraordinary um, example of life imitating art, Dorothy L. Sayers, Agatha Christie's uh, contemporary writer, went to the family home to search for clues. Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, went to a spiritualist um, meeting, because he was a great spiritualist, to try and see if they could work out where Agatha Christie had gone to. Well, it turned out that 10 days later, she was found, and she was found here. And this on the left is the Old Swan Hotel in the Yorkshire spa town of Harrogate, which was then known as the Hydropathic Hotel. And Agatha Christie had checked in under a false name, the name she checked in on was the name of the husband's mistress, Mrs. Nancy Neal. And the only reason that she was discovered was because two members of the Palm Court band in the hotel had recognised her from the newspaper reports. And to their credit, they contacted the police, not the newspapers, um, and then her, her cover was blown. What happened? What was her motive? It still remains, perhaps today, the greatest mystery of Agatha Christie's life. Um, and famously, there's Agatha Christie leaving the hotel. She couldn't recall what had happened to her. She never, ever spoke about the disappearance ever again. Today, her family do not 
really ever want to discuss anything surrounding the disappearance. Um, some people think she was trying to frame a husband for murder. Wouldn't that have been a wonderful, um, you know, life imitating art? Was it a publicity stunt? Well, if it did, it didn't do her any harm. Um, but the most likely explanation is that she had some kind of mental breakdown. Um, and as I said, it remains a mystery to this date. In 1928, they got divorced, which was again, pretty, still pretty uh, rare in those days. She got custody of her daughter. She needs money. So she now starts to write a very different series of stories. In April 1930, she published the first six, well, romance stories. Well, yeah, they were, I suppose, really. But uh, they were published under this pseudonym, Mary Westmacott, and they were psychologically very complex. Um, and in a way, people now suggest that she was dealing with the trauma of the aftermath of her divorce. But she kept this pseudonym of, of um, Mary Westmacott a secret for 20 years. It was only 20 years later that her identity was revealed and she was extremely cross about um, uh, you know, her cover being blown. And I don't know, just in the last few months on Radio 4, uh, they've adapted some of these Mary Westmacott novels into Radio 4 plays uh, and I listened to one just a few weeks ago and it was really excellent actually. In April 1930 um, she's getting a lot of press attention because of the divorce and she decides she needs to get away from England um, and she has a very keen interest in archaeology um, and she's uh, she plans to go traveling and she initially decided to go to the West Indies but she'd heard about a dig that was going on in Baghdad um, in the Middle East. And she thought, well, that sounds rather exciting. Um, and I'm going to travel. And she took a journey on a very famous train indeed. Here it is, the Orient Express. Um, and you can see the route that she would have taken all the way from England. Um, and in fact, the, the Orient Express in those days only went as far as Istanbul. So in fact, she ended up having to take the rest of her journey to Baghdad by uh, uh, motor coach and car but you know this she was traveling on her own as a woman in the 19 1930 i mean pretty intrepid uh, this hotel in istanbul the peri peri hotel if ever you get a chance to go they claim well she definitely stayed there but they claim that it was here that she got the inspiration having been on the train to write murder on the orange but she carries on and there she is uh, traveling all the way um on the bus from Damascus all the way down to Baghdad. Now she's invited to join an archeological dig at this location, which is the ancient city of Ur, which is basically near you know, modern day um, uh, Basra today in what of course is now Iraq. Um, and the invite comes from a lady called Lady Catherine Woolley. And this dig is being undertaken by her husband who is the leading archeologist of the age, a man called Leonard Woolley or he would become Sir Leonard Woolley. And here's a photograph of Leonard and his wife excavating at Ur. Now, Woolley had gone out to Ur in 1922, um, leading this Anglo-American financed dig um, to this ancient city, this royal city of Ur, which of course was, you know, three and a half thousand years old. Um, and they made some of the most sensational finds there since the discovery of King Tut's tomb in Egypt in 1922. And Agatha Christie's time here, uh, joining this, this dig, leads to a novel. And it was called Murder in Mesopotamia. Um, and what's rather nice, a uh, nice little story about this, is that Catherine Woolley, who'd invited her out there, was a rather difficult woman. Um, and uh, I don't think in the end she was very keen on having Agatha Christie there because she thought she was a bit of a you know, female um, sort of, you know, um, competition. Um, and uh, Agatha Christie uh, based the murder victim of murder in Mesopotamia on Catherine Woolley, who was the wife of the archaeologist. Um, and because uh, uh, people never tend to recognise themselves, do they? Uh, I think in literature, and, and she never realised that she was being sent up rather uh, mercilessly in, in the novel. Um, now, um, she went uh, back um, and then uh, she, 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 she went back again the following year to, uh, to the dig. Um, and this time she meets 
she meets Leonard Woolley's assistant, and his name is Max Mallowan. And in the middle there, you can see Agatha with Max Mallowan. He was 14 years younger than uh, she was. And six months later, they got married. Uh, Agatha Christie's second husband. And that was a very happy marriage indeed, and lasted their whole lives. And for the next 30 years, the two of them went on archaeological digs almost every year. Now, if you think you know that name, Ur, and you might have heard of it, well, if you've been to the British Museum uh, recently, uh, the, the riches of Ur are displayed there. Um, and this is a, a wonderful dagger. I thought that was appropriate, given it's Agatha Christie, uh, which is one of, one of the many items on display. But the most famous item that was discovered in these royal graves at Ur was this um, thing called the Standard of Ur. And nobody really knows what the Standard of Ur is, but it's one of the highlights of the British Museum. And uh, we think it was probably used as, as some kind of banner uh, that, that was carried in processions. But what it shows you, I mean, without going into the whole story, is essentially um, the hierarchy of uh, life in Mesopotamia three and a half thousand years ago. And it's, and, and if you, it's made of, of precious um, stones, including all this beautiful lapis lazuli sort of in, in the background. Um, and, and it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, also at the British Museum, um, we have uh, these wonderful ivories called the Nimrud ivories. Um, Max Mallowan went on to become, you know, the next sort of leading archaeologist of, of the age, sort of between, you know, the 1940s and the 1960s. And he uh, started to excavate at a place called Nimrud uh, in northern Iraq, which was once the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And Agatha accompanied him on all, all the excavations there, and they built her a house so she could carry on writing. Uh, and he found these small ivory plaques, actually thousands of them in fragments, dating back about two and a half to three thousand years. And many of them were discovered at the bottom of wells, which had been presumably, um, uh, they'd been thrown in there when this ancient city was, was sacked. Um, and they were originally covered in gold leaf and lapis lazuli, and they were covered in mud and sludge at the bottom of these wells. And Agatha recalled helping photograph these fragments and uh, cleaning them with an orange stick and a pot of uh, face cream. Um, and the reason I tell you that is because the British Museum actually bought a third of these Mallowan ivories in um, 2011, um, about 1,000 complete ones uh, for one point two million pounds, one of the most expensive purchases ever bought by the British Museum. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, uh, this quite interesting connection with archaeology. Now in 1930 um, also, this all happening the same year, we meet um, Agatha Christie's next great detective and her name is Miss Jane Marple. And she first appears in a short story in a magazine called The Tuesday, uh, the Tuesday Night Club. Um, but she first appears in The Murder at the Vicarage in 1930. Why the name Miss Marple? Um, we believe that she got it from this great big house in Cheshire. Marple uh, is a little uh, town in Cheshire. And actually, Agatha Christie's sister lived in Cheshire nearby. and the railway station at Marple had that plaque unveiled just a few years ago to commemorate the, um, the connection. Uh, just to go back in a moment. Um, interesting that she, she'd chosen Miss Marple, who, who was uh, an elderly uh, lady who had never married, who lives in this village called St. Mary Mead. And again, I think the fact that, um, you know, there were, there were 1.7 million more women um, that were single after the First World War. And I think perhaps creating a single female detective was uh, was part of that. Um, she, she described as a pink and white old lady who, having led the most sheltered and Victorian of lives, nevertheless always seemed to be acquainted with the depths of depravity. She always expected the worst of everyone and everything and with, was with almost frightening accuracy usually proved right. And she based Miss Marple largely on those aunts that she'd grown up with in um, Ealing. Um, now, Miss Marple lives in this little village uh, called St Mary Mead, which um, is probably the most dangerous village to live in in England. Um, and uh, I think uh, in the course of um, uh, six out of the 12 Miss Marple stories, there was, so there were 12 Miss Marple stories, six of them were set in the village and 34 people uh, are killed across the, uh, the course of six novels. So I think apart from the, the village in um, Midsummer Murders, I think it must be the most dangerous place to live. Um, and, th and there's a map rather helpfully 
published um, there of, of, of St Mary Mead. It's 25 miles um, by train from Paddington, and we think it's in the southwest of the country somewhere, probably in a, maybe Hampshire, um, but it is also near the seaside, about 12 miles from the seaside resort. Um, and of course, um, Miss Marple again, often familiar to us, of course, through television and film. Margaret Rutherford on the left played Miss Marple in a series of rather comic films, which Agatha Christie wasn't terribly keen on, actually, um, but th th they were wonderful. Um, Angela Lansbury played Miss Marple just once in the 1980s um, in, in a film of the mirror crack from side to side. And in the more recent years, last, what, 10 years, both uh, Geraldine McEwen on the bottom left and Julie McKenzie on the bottom right have played Miss Marple in the uh, ITV reimagining of the uh, Miss Marple stories. But I have to say, not any of them come close to this lady, who for me is the only Miss Marple. And I certainly remember as a child sitting down with my grandparents on a Sunday night uh, in the 1980s, you know, watching these wonderful uh, TV versions. And that's Joan Hickson. Um, and the series was filmed in this little village um, called Nether Wallop um, in Hampshire, which actually is a little bit further away than 25 miles from Paddington, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's exactly how we imagine St. Mary Mead to be. Um, and I think definitely one of the most um, uh, if you can hear that, can you hear that? Only, only just. Sorry, that was my attempt to just introduce the sound effect. That was the, that was the theme tune from the BBC series, Miss Marple. I think it's one of the greatest uh, theme tunes ever written for television. Um, uh, so, sorry, sound, a bit of a sound issue. Um, so, Miss Marple is introduced, um, and then... Throughout the 1930s, Agatha Christie is absolutely prolific, and many of her um, novels are written now while she's living in London. And she actually lived in a bewildering array of homes in London in the 1930s. Um, she'd, actually moved, she'd actually moved to London originally in 1918, just after the end of the First World War, and she and Archie lived up in St John's Wood in um, North London, in a villa up there. Um, and then throughout the 30s, she owned eight different properties, mostly in West London, Kensington, Chelsea, although also Hampstead uh, made a veil. And she did things which I suppose, you know, weren't so common then. She bought up rather run-down sort of slummy houses uh, and did them up and then sold them on. Um, so she could you know, buy to let. She was a buy to let landlord, really. Uh, and she said she was addicted to buying houses. And this house on the left-hand side is in Creswell Place. It's just near Gloucester Road Tube Station. And it's a, a lovely little muse house. It's rather like a doll's house. Um, and it's way down a little narrow cobbled street. And of course, we all know that Mews had horses and carriages from the big grand townhouses. Um, and it's the only house she never sold um, during her, her lifetime. So she always kept that house. And it inspired this novel, The Murder in the Mews, which you can see on the right hand side. Um, then um, she moves around uh, to Camden Street. This is also in Kensington. There's no blue plaque outside this property. But um, she did live here for four years and she did write um, three novels, including um, The Murder at the Vicarage, which we've just talked about, and this novel, Why Didn't They Ask Evans. Then she moved to Sheffield Terrace in Kensington and Chelsea, sort of in Notting Hill. Um, and there is a blue plaque there. You can see that on the left outside, this lovely sort of detached house. Um, and she had her own room for the first time where she could work, so she liked that. And it's here that she writes, I mean, all those novels that you can see, Death in the Clouds, The ABC Murders, One, Two, Buckle My Shoe. Lots of the titles, by the way, come from nursery rhyme. She loved playing around with nursery rhyme titles. Um, and she also wrote these three novels while she's living there, remember, inspired by her travels. So we've got Murder in Mesopotamia, Appointment with Death, and um, Death on the Nile, all written in the middle of the 1930s. And again, you know, I think these these we, we often think of all of her novels being exotic, but um, but but 
they weren't, but but these are, and, and she loved the idea that her readers could travel, you know, to all these exotic locations without leaving their armchair. And I think at the moment, you know, as we can't go anywhere at the moment, I think picking up an Agatha Christie novel that's set, you know, in Egypt or somewhere marvellous is wonderful, you know, escapism. Um, but her perhaps, perhaps her most famous novel of all time was also um, while she was living in that house, and it was Murder on the Orient Express. And I'm sure you may well have seen the film a version, but there, there's the interior of the Orient Express. Uh, uh, and of course, the, without giving anything away, again, it's an utterly brilliant uh, plot, perhaps, perhaps the best, really, or one of the best. And it's based on a real-life story of the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, uh, Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, his child was kidnapped and uh, and um, uh, and killed. And without telling you any more about the story, if you haven't read it, um, it is based on on that story. Um, and in 1938, the family home in Devon was sold. It was getting very built up in Torquay at that time. I think they sort of, uh, they didn't like that. And so Agatha bought this beautiful late, sort of late Jacobean home, I suppose, or maybe early Georgian, um, on the banks of the River Dart in Devon. And it was called Greenway. Um, and it was described by Agatha Christie as the loveliest place in the world. And she spent every, virtually every summer here until her death. And you can see she's there with her husband, the archaeologist Max Mallowan, and their dogs. They were, they were big dog lovers. And in um, 2011, I think it was now, um, uh, her daughter Rosalind died. Her Rosalind's son, so Agatha Christie's grandson, Matthew Pritchard, gave the house over to the National Trust and it was restored. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's ever been down there. Um, I still haven't been yet. I was planning to go last year. <laughs> uh, all those plans um, went awry, but uh, I'm definitely going to go when I can. Uh, and you can visit the National Trust home of Agatha Christie. Uh, while she's uh, here, she, she has a little idea about how she can really create mass murder. Uh, and she's thinking, how can I kill lots of people off one by one in lots of horrible ways? And the inspiration um, comes from this island just off the coast of Devon. Um, and it's called Berg Island. And it's uh, got a very full um, uh, uh, Burr, the Burr Island Hotel. And it opened in 1929. Everybody went there, including Agatha Christie, Noel Coward, Churchill, everybody went there. But in 1939, uh, Burr Island became Soldier Island for this novel. And then there were none. And I love the cover of the story. Can you see the, 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 the skeleton's hand is pointing down towards the hotel on the island. I think that's great. Um, in 2015, the public voted this as Agatha Christie's best novel. Uh, no Miss Marple, no Poirot, a closed mystery, they can't escape this island. Um, uh, a voice announces that uh, uh, all of the people sitting around the dinner table have been um, in responsible for murdering somebody and they're all going to be bumped off one by one. And of course, very famously, the original title of the novel uh, was uh, considered to be extremely politically incorrect. It was called Ten Little Niggers. Then it became 10 little Indians, and then it eventually became, and then there were none. Um, in 1941, the same island became the inspiration for another Poirot story called Evil Under the Sun. And it becomes uh, Smuggler's Island um, and the Jolly Roger Hotel. Now, uh, during the Blitz, that house in Kensington was bombed and Agatha Christie was forced to move. And she moved here to a building in Hampstead. Some of you might know this. This is the Isacon building um, in um, um, Lawn Road. Um, and it was a four story block of um, studio apartments designed by a Canadian architect for uh, uh, the founders of the Isacon Design Company. So she, because her husband was um, posted overseas during the Second World War, she was living here basically on her own. And uh, she wrote, again, a prolific amount, 12 novels during the Second World War. Uh, she wrote two books because she was worried she'd be killed and she wanted something for her um, her child, uh, her daughter to have for the future. Um, she writes a spy novel while she's living here because there were Russian spies living in the building as well. Um, and in fact, she was even investigated by MI5 because one of the characters in the spy novel uh, was... Um, 
was called Major Bletchley, and she thought that uh, they thought Agatha Christie had some connections to Bletchley Park, and that perhaps she even had a spy uh, in in Britain's top code breaking centre. So I mean, he, he extraordinary, really, isn't it? Um, and I won't go through all the novels she wrote, but she wrote a, a number of Poirot novels, uh, Miss Marples. This novel was written. This is called Five Little Pigs, and um, this probably is the most again brilliant plot and it's a murder that happened 16 years ago which is so it's actually a murder that's investigated uh, in the past and um, a woman is convicted of killing her artist husband and uh, poison is used yet again and the poison that's used in that story is hemlock uh, well actually it's called conine which is a, which is an alkaloid that comes from hemlock and i mention that because there it is on the right but on the left is university college um, hospital in bloomsbury and Agatha Christie took up her pharmaceutical duties again during the Second World War and actually uh, retrained, updated her knowledge of poison. So we get even more poisons um, uh, after the Second World War. Um, and 1945, at the end of the war, she published Sparkling Cyanide, which was the first of her books to sell over a million copies. Uh, she also wrote her last Miss Marple story and her last Poirot story, but she put them in a safe and... Uh, the instructions were given that they were not to be published until after she had died. Um, 1950, she publishes her 50th novel, A Murder is Announced. It's a Miss Marple story. I think it's my favourite of the Miss Marple stories. It's not set in St Mary Mead, but another village called Chipping Cleghorn. And what's very interesting is that it's a post-war novel. And, um, you know, the village life has completely changed from... Um, the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, there's only one cleaning woman in the village. People have ration coupons they're still dealing with. There are fuel shortages. Um, uh, one of the characters uh, sells things on the black market. Uh, there's a foreigner who has a, a, an identity card that's fake. And actually, that's kind of part of the uh, solution in the end, partly. Um, uh, but it's interesting that you, you see these changes um, in that novel. 1947... Agatha is commissioned to write a radio play for Queen Mary's 80th birthday. Queen Mary is a huge Agatha Christie fan. And the play, the radio play, is called Three Blind Mice. And it goes on to become the longest running play in the world because she's encouraged to turn it into a, a stage play. Now, unfortunately, there's already a stage play called Three Blind Mice in the West End at the time. So they have to change the name. And her son, in fact, came up with the new title and he said, let's call it The Mousetrap. And The Mousetrap opened on the 25th of November, 1952 at the Ambassador's Theatre in the heart of the West End. This is a program from the play when it was originally at the Ambassador's. And by the 13th of September, 1956, only four years later, it was already the longest running play in British theatre history. Um, it was even performed at War Wormwood Scrubs, a version was, was performed there. Two prisoners escaped during the performance, uh, but history doesn't record whether they went on to commit murder. Um, but um, in 1974, the play closed at the Ambassadors because the, the lease had expired on the on the theatre, and it, it closed on the Saturday night, and it opened on the Monday night next door at this theatre, the St Martin's Theatre which is next door to the Ambassadors. And it opened there and it has been running there ever since. And uh, last year it was in its 68th year. This year it would, well, it is in its 69th year. And it was running, of course, until <laughs> March. Um, but only COVID has been uh, responsible for bringing the mousetrap to a, a temporary, um, temporary end. Um, Every year, of course, they have to update the signage on the front of the theatre. And this guy, James, uh, is the guy responsible for changing the numbers. His father did the original lighting on the front of the theatre, and it's his family that have maintained the signage ever since. So I think that's a nice story. I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with the story of the mousetrap, but um, it's, of course, set in, again, it's set in a bed and breakfast um, uh, run by this young couple. Um, there's a snowstorm, people are trapped. Uh, a police detective arrives on snowshoes. Uh, a radio announcement is made to say that a killer, the rest, uh, you'll have to find out for yourselves. But what's kept the mousetrap going, of course, is that um, uh, you're sworn to secrecy at the end of the play. All the audience is sworn not to reveal the identity of the murderer. And um, that's what, what's kept it going. 
Uh, by the way, one of the original cast members is still in the play. Now, how's that possible? Well, it's actually the voice of the radio announcer. It's still the original recording from 1952. And the voice of the radio announcer, if you're really interested, is Derek Geiler. Do you remember Derek Geiler, the actor that was in um, Please, Sir, all those years ago? So his voice is still heard. <laughs> all those years later. Right, uh, 2012, I think I said this monument was unveiled today, Magatha Christie, um, in the West End. Uh, the mousetrap is on it, um, at the top, and um, all of her novels are around the bottom of the monument, and in fact the, the whole monument itself is indeed a large book. Um, and on the other side are images of Miss Marple and um, Hercule Poirot. And I should just add, by the way, that in the middle of the 1950s, not only was the mousetrap running, but there were three other Agatha Christie plays, all having very successful West End um, runs. And many of them transferred was the most successful, or she is the most successful female playwright of all time. Uh, 1960s now, uh, we're getting towards the end of Agatha's career. Uh, these three novels are published. The Pale Horse, which is all set in modern swinging sort of um, London. Um, we get women walking down the King's Road in short skirts. Um, and it's a very supernatural story. Uh, 1962, The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side, another, uh, the, uh, another Miss Marple story, inspired by a Tennyson poem, The Lady of Shalott. Um, and then Nemesis, uh, which was written in 1971 on the right. Uh, sorry, um, yes, that's right, 1971 on the right. Um, and again, you see in, in the middle one, The Mirror Crack from Side to Side, it's the last Miss Marple story. Uh, and um, uh, Miss Marple's friends who, who did live in the big house, now live in the lodge at the end of the by American film stars um, and again it just shows you the sort of changes that are happening uh, in English society there are also two lesbian characters in uh, Nemesis written on the right hand side there and I think if you told Agatha Christie in 1920 that she'd be writing about a lesbian couple in the late 1960s she'd have been probably quite surprised and I also want to draw your attention to the covers of the novels now when I was a child these are the covers that I remember and they were all published by Fontana and the artwork is absolutely amazing and they were done by a guy called Tom Adams uh, and he I think uh, probably has produced the most famous body of paperback art ever produced uh, and he was commissioned to do all of the paperback um, images uh, for every Agatha Christie book from 1962, I think, right the way through to 1979. He was often commissioned to do um, the same novel, but with, with different artwork. Look at this, this is a murder is announced. And it's really kind of surreal. I mean, really surreal images. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the clues to the solution are actually embedded in the artwork on the front of the novel. Um, and this is him, he died, he only died about two years ago. And a sadly, Agatha Christie apparently wasn't terribly pleased with, um, with, with his images, but I think they're absolutely fantastic. Now we're nearly at the end here, uh, 1965, lots of luxury hotels have graced the pages of Agatha Christie's stories. Um, this is Brown's Hotel on the right hand side in Mayfair. And this features in at Bertram's Hotel, published in 1965. Um, Agatha knew the hotel very well. She took uh, tea there quite regularly, and it becomes a Miss Marple story at Bertram's Hotel. Um, and it's it, it all seems very genteel on the surface, but actually there are very sinister goings on in the hotel. It was a real bestseller. It sold 50,000 copies in six weeks. Uh, some people think that Fleming's Hotel might have been another inspiration for the same story. Um, 1974. Um, the film version of Murder on the Orient Express is launched, starring Albert Finney. The premiere was at Leicester Square. Agatha Christie went to the premiere. That was the last time she appeared in public. Um, and the party was held here at Claridge's Hotel in Mayfair. And if you really want, you know, that wonderful... Uh, if you want a bit of 1920s, 1930s glamour uh, when lockdown is over treat yourselves to afternoon tea at Claridge's uh, and you can, you know, sort of immerse yourself in, again, that sort of Agatha Christie's um, world. Um, uh, there is a suggestion that Agatha Christie was due to write a story based on the white horse at Uffington. Uh, she did, ha she has, there are notebooks with notes about it, but sadly she never got to, um, never got to finish it. Um, this is 
The Last Poirot Story. It was published in 1975. It was written during the Second World War, but remember, she put it in a bank vault and she said, I want it to be published after my death, but her daughter convinced her to publish it before she died. Um, and we go back to Styles, back to Styles in this story. Poirot is now very old, very frail. He's actually in a wheelchair. And without giving anything away, he does die. Um, and um, it's a very shocking murder. And in 1975, Poirot was given a front page obituary in the New York Times. And he's the only literary character ever to have received an obituary in a newspaper. In 1976, Agatha Christie died on the 12th of January here at her home in Oxfordshire, Winterbrook, in mysterious circumstances. Actually, I'm making that up. She didn't. She died of natural causes. But wouldn't it have been appropriate if Agatha Christie had died uh, of unknown causes? On the day she died, the mouse trapped the uh, St. Martin's Theatre and another theatre, the Savoy Theatre, dimmed their lights in her memory. This is where Agatha's buried in St. Mary's Churchyard in Oxfordshire. A memorial service was held at St. Martin in the Fields Parish Church. And in 1976, uh, several months after she died, this novel was published posthumously, Sleeping Murder, appropriately enough, Miss Marple's last case. Now, this is a bust of Agatha Christie in Torquay. This was unveiled just a few years ago because if you want to go on the Agatha Christie trail, you can go down to the seaside and visit her hometown. This lady is Joan Knott. And Joan Knott is wearing her blue badge. She is a blue badge tourist guide. And she started doing Agatha Christie tours back in the 1970s on the English Riviera. She was still guiding in her 90s, God bless her. And um, she is 100, I think 101 now. She's still alive and well. And in fact, she was born in the same year that Agatha Christie published The Mysterious Affair at Styles in 1920. And we're nearly at the end here, um, but I've got one final mystery to share with you. We talked about the murder of Roger Ackroyd in 1926, voted by detective writers as the best detective story ever written. We now think possibly that Agatha Christie might have borrowed the plot twist from this author on the right, a Norwegian crime writer called Stein Riverton. And he wrote a novel um, in 1909 called Jernvonjen. Sorry, don't speak Norwegian but it translates as the Iron Chariot. And it was both voted the best Norwegian crime novel writ written by the Crime Writers Association of Norway. Now the book came out in England after the murder of Roger Ackroyd was published, but it was only published in Norwegian and it wasn't translated until 2005 into English. So we've always understood that Agatha Christie could never have read it unless she presumably spoke Norwegian. But it now turns out that in 1923, Riverton's story was published in six monthly installments in um, a magazine called The Tip Top Stories of Adventure and Mystery, which was discovered in the British Library. So the question is, did she read the story? Did she borrow the plot device? Is it a coincidence? Well, she definitely knew the magazine and she published some of her Mary Westmacott stories in that same magazine. But as with so much of Agatha Christie's life, it remains an unsolved mystery. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to um, ask you to uh, uh, turn on your video screens. Um, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, as always, for your kind attention this afternoon. I hope you've uh, uh, found that interesting, uh, informative, uh, entertaining a little bit, enjoyable. Um, and I hope perhaps, well, I guess what I really wanted to do is, is just, I think there's, there's a lot more to Agatha Christie than, than meets the eye. And I think, you know, um, she's, a, she's a much better writer, I think, than sometimes often people give her credit for. Um, so... Um, uh, you know, whenever it's, you know, a dull grey day outside and sort of, you know, it's raining and it's winter time, um, there's nothing better than just to go make up a tea and get yourself a slice of cake and either pick up an Agatha Christie or put the Miss Marple on the TV and just, you know, transport yourselves back to, you know, that's what I like to do anyway. <laughs> like that. So, Simon, Simon, yes. thank you so much for that wonderful insight to an extraordinary authoress. Uh, not only does your idea of a cup of tea and a slice of cake sound nice, but also afternoon tea and carrot, I have. Oh, yes. 
especially in the current circumstances where we can't do almost anything in terms of getting out and socialising. I suppose for me, Hercule, Hercule Poirot, the okay. ultimate one has to be David Suchet. Um, although there are clearly other good actors who have taken place, but what a wonderful insight to the whole library of Agatha Christie's books. And I, I just wonder if Midsummer Murders was based on the stories that Sir Mary Mead, it uh, could quite well have been, who knows. Well, I think she, I think she did inspire an awful lot of everything that followed. Really, I mean, you think of all those films like Clue, you know, which was that film made in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> and did you see that film with yeah, was it called Knives Without Daggers or something that came out last year with, um, oh, what's his name, um, you know, Daniel Craig? Did you see that? It was sort of it was a pastiche of, of of a murder. Well, it was all it was all you know all based on Agatha Christie. I mean, yeah. Has anyone here got sort of favourite Agatha Christie, you know, novels or has anybody, you know, got any sort of... Yes, oh yes, do make sure the cake isn't laced with cyanide. That's right, yeah. if, if you're going to have a, a slice of cake. That's right. Hen Henry, Henry, you wanted to say something, but you're muted at the moment. Oh, thank you. Yes, sorry. The, the, the Daughter of Time is the novel I was trying to think of by Josephine Tay, which is about, um, uh, you know, the, the well, a sort of reimagining really of of the Richard the Third um, story. It's fantastic, a fantastic yeah. book. Yeah. Go, go on, Henry. My my favorite uh Poirot on the television is the kidnapped Prime Minister. Because there is no murder in it and this it's all very mysterious. Oh we've got somebody's screen. Who's that? Is somebody gonna show us something? I don't know. I'm trying to I think, it, I think it was Cynthia Lemon. So right, go on. Henry, Henry, Cynthia Henry, Lemon, on. it said she's sharing her screen. It's all well, right thank now. You, Cynthia. It, it, it's gone now, so Henry, no, it carry hasn't. on. Oh, Speak up loud. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. we can hear you, Henry, yes. My favourite Agatha Christie is the Poirot, which is the kidnapped Prime Minister. Oh, yes. Ah, that's one of the uh, the Poirot short stories, isn't it? Yes. yes, I think yes. Yes, there's I, no murder. There's no actual murder in it, and I like that. <laughs> ah, yes, that's right. Yes, yes. So it's a mystery, but not a, a, a murder mystery. That's right. Yes, yes. Oh, I tell you what was on the other day, which I did watch because I, I can't resist. Evil Under the Sun, um, mm. which yes. is uh, with Peter Ustinov, and I do have a soft spot for Peter Ustinov. I think he's a marvelous, yeah, he mar marvelous actor. Um, but but actually. Uh, it, it's based on that novel that was set on Berg Island. So the novel was set in Devon, but they didn't, that was glamorous enough for the film. So, so they set it on Mallorca and it becomes a, a much more, and it's all got the music of Cole Porter. It's fantastic. Um, I, hadn't I hadn't watched it for years, that one. And I thought, well, oh, that's as good as Death on the Nile, that one. Um, or, or Margaret, you, Margaret, you yeah. wanted to come in? I did. First of all, thank you. It was very, very enjoyable, very interesting. And just a little bit of information. About 20 years ago, we had a wedding in Harrogate and we stayed in the Swan Hotel. And outside our bedroom, there was a plaque to say Agatha Christie's room. Uh, oh, so you that. stayed in Agatha's room? Or we actually stayed in that room where she was in Harrogate in the Swan. Lovely hotel. Oh, that, well, that's that's good tip. I isn't actually it? spoke, to, and we always talk about it. We stay, and then I was. That's why I wanted to listen to you today because I'm so sort of. I, I like a lot of her stuff, but uh, also we stayed in that room when she disappeared. So that yes. was quite interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's all shrouded in mystery. That I mean, and the well, family they don't they don't ever discuss it. It's it's one no, of those. No, I was that... talking to the receptionist about it actually. And because when, when we booked in, she said, you're going to be staying in the Agatha Christie room. And I didn't know anything about it, you know. But um, since then, we've, we've read all the different things about it. So it was yeah. quite interesting. Very nice hotel, actually. Yeah. Yes. I stayed there. Have I you? stayed there for a wedding also a yeah. long time ago. About 20 years, as was, yeah. Maybe the same wedding. <laughs> Well, there we go. There's another trip. If, oh, if we can't travel abroad, we can travel up to Harrogate and, and take a, you know, a lovely, lovely day cake. we had there. It was lovely. Yeah. Marion, Marion, did you want to come in? You're, you're on mute, Marion. Many years ago, we went to the Golders Green Hippodrome. We used to go regularly there. We went with about six friends sitting in the row. The, the curtains pulled back and I said, I've seen this. And somebody said, how can you have seen it? I said, I will write down the whole story for you. And at the end, you'll see I am right. We saw the mousetrap, but it was called 
three blind mice. Oh. Oh. That was in oh. Golders Green. Oh, gosh. Many, many years ago. I could not believe it because we went to see it in town after that and the comparison, it was there. How interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Anything, uh, anything, anything uh, else? I was going to say that we were in Jaffa in 1988 when they were filming Appointment with Death. And um, that was very good. They had uh, David Soul, I think, in that, and they were filming it in, in Jaffa in Israel. Oh, that's right. That's that's another Poirot with uh, with Peter Houston off, isn't it? Um, yeah, appointment with Peter death. Houston, but yes, um, we were there when they were filming it. There, they were filming all round. Um, where was it set actually in the in the book? Is that uh, it, again, it's Meso it, it, um, well, it's Mesopotamia again, isn't it? I think. Oh. I think. Yes, mm. I think so. But that was good. Okay. All right, look, I, I think we need to let Simon. Hello. 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 I'm all right, I've got time, no problem. Okay. Can I say something? Yes, go on, who's that? It's Liz, Liz. Go on, Liz. Liz Mayer. hi. Yeah. I just want to say that was the most inspiring talk. I love oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's our 46th wedding anniversary today, and I can't think of a better treat. Than Happy, anniversary Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, but it was inspiring and lovely, and you know, and it, it was something that's very close to the heart because I Good. love Agatha Christie. So, Good. Thank you yes. so much. Happy that's a lovely thing to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I come in for a minute, please? Yes, who's that? Stanley. Stanley. Good, Stanley. Yeah. Right. Now, the first Agatha Christie story I ever read was Ten Little. And then there were none. It's now called Then There Were None. I thought it was wonderful. But at the time of, I remember living in Belfast, I was in the Scouts. I must have been about 15. We went over to England to a camp and we went to London and we were supposed to see a, a play in, I forget. And they, we got an apology from the people who owned the theatre, that the play had stopped, but they had another play. You might like it. It was called The Mousetrap. Oh. And I remember seeing The Mousetrap shortly after it started. I thought it was wonderful. I remember there was she Sheila Sims was in it. I think her husband, but I can't remember his name. And It I was Richard, At Richard Attenborough, Stanley. That's right, Richard Attenborough. Very good. Well done. <laughs> but I remember that it was a wonderful play and we were all wrong at the end as to who we thought was the murderer. And I'm not going to tell you who the murderer is because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the great thing also. If you go back and reread the novels, if you go back and reread them, I, I mean, I, I forget who, who did it. I forget who, who did it. It doesn't matter. I've forgotten since the last time. So, so you can reread them, I think, you know... Um, over and over again, really. Yeah, there's a great story about Richard Attenborough, by the way. So, so in the it, he was he was the first cast, um, and they in those days they took a percentage of the box office, the actors. So they took a percentage of the takings, and he made a lot of money from the Mousetrap, Richard Attenborough, and he ended up buying a restaurant in Mayfair, um, mm. which eventually he had to sell because, of course, he he was hemorrhaging money making all those fantastic films like um, you know Gandhi in the 1980s. But he made, but he made a lot of money from the mousetrap, Richard Attenborough and Sheila Sheila Sim. Yes. Could I make a comment? Mm. Yes. Who's that? Brenda. Um, Brenda. Brenda. Go, on, Brenda. If I may, I wanted to direct it to Marion and Henry Herbst. Hi. Hope you're okay. I just wanted. We were all from. We used to live in Ealing many years ago. And I just wanted to say that I didn't realise we lived in such a famous place. I didn't realise it had connections with Agatha Christie. And of course, I'm, I'm a real fan of all her things. Yes. Yeah. Great. Her first, yeah, first literary achievement was written <laughs> about Ealing. That's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Simon, yeah. Simon, thank you so much once again. You can clearly see how interesting everybody found this. And uh, no doubt you've got plenty more up your sleeve. And we look forward to welcoming you back sometime in the future. I'll leave that for Daphne to uh, link in with you, Simon. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you. I just want to say thank you myself. Um, you're, and you're always willing to help out because we had you a few weeks ago as well. So thank you so much. 
and you're very popular. You had at one point 128 people Ooh. watching, but that's a lot more because they were they're doubles, they're just log ons. So you're on the top one of the top ones on our list, I must tell you. Oh, well, that's <laughs> lovely to hear. Good. And I look Good. forward very much. I'll be in touch with you and let next later on in the year, we hope that you'll come back and give us another wonderful talk. Yes. Well, you know, as Oscar Wilde said, and that might be another subject for a future talk because I do Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde said, you know, the, it's, you know, the audience is half the battle. So, so as long as the audience is, is interested and keen and enthusiastic, half the job's done. So it's thanks to you as well for being, you know, thank you uh, an erudite thank and interesting group of people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Simon. Very much. Well done, Simon. Stay